we have such an influx of info coming in, but we don't have enough time to process or put it out the right way. And so I think sometimes it's just sifting through things to be able to go, oh, I took that little nugget from that book, that thing from that podcast, that from that conversation, then my own creativity, and then I throw it back. It's part of the process. So I think having time to process things is super important. Welcome to The Raquel Show. This show is for entrepreneurs who want to play bigger in business and in life. And today I have a very special guest who I've known for many years, but really have gotten to know and have fun with this last couple of years. I've always respected her in the industry. We share a mutual, amazing friends. And I wanted to bring her on the show because she comes with a lot of experiences in building businesses and seeing leadership from a different level and really seeing the landscape of our real estate industry and has worn many, many hats. Her leadership continues to inspire all of us. And I can't wait for you all to hear from her. So welcome to the show, Miss Kimberly Ryan. Yay. Thank you. So such sweet words. Oh my gosh. You're so fun. <laughs> I'm excited. It, it is happening. honest, right? Well, you know, maybe. I mean, I could put the fun shoes in there too. There's that. <laughs> <laughs> You're so cute. So we're going to dive right in and we can go in so many different directions, like I said, with this conversation, but let's start with leadership. How important is leadership, especially in today's climate? You know, it's so funny. Probably for 10 years, I've been saying things like, there's no better time for like leaders to rise up. And then it's 10 years later and I, geez, there's no better time than for leaders to rise up. So I just think it, for me, it must just be this perpetual need that society needs, right? And requires of us. And I look around and not just in our industry, but I mean, if you really take a worldview and not from a political place or anything, but if you look at our schools, you look at our churches, you look at our communities, you look at our government, you look at our healthcare, you look at all sorts, where, 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 where are actual leaders with strong convictions and the ability to con communicate and convey how important some of these issues are, and then somebody to have the chutzpah to lead and keep going, right? And so I think we see kind of the rise and fall through history, but I think we are I, I just feel like the whole world is in need of actual leadership and people who say, listen, I strongly have, I believe in these convictions and here's my proof of why I believe in them. And then here's what I think we should do about them. And then let's go. And I just, I think sometimes people are quieted and I, so they aren't allowed to rise up, right. in different things and not even in our own industry. So I think there is probably no time like the present to really have people who are I think natural born leaders and then people who have taught themselves, taken their natural abilities and really expanded them to be able to say, hey, listen, I'm comfortable in my skin as a leader. I know that I can influence people, not from a manipulation perspective, but from a contribution perspective. And I think there's a big difference. What do you think makes a good leader? You know, that I, a few things. I think a good leader is somebody who lives their life in a way that honestly, when they're the same person here as they are there, that you don't have these facades and these personas that people are building. I think to really be authentically and genuinely who you are and understand that as a leader, you have your own flaws, right? But then for a follower, that it, it is okay that your leaders have flaws, right? And I think that we have this kind of weird pedestal view of what a leader should be, which I think is why a lot of really good leaders don't really feel like they're good leaders because they're so afraid to fall off the pedestal that they create this persona. It's a really weird I scenario, I think. I think people who are just genuinely have a concern that lights a fire for them to want to make and affect change. And I think those people naturally have an attraction. So it's easy to have followers, but I think a really good leader is also a really good follower. And so I think you have to be teachable. I think you have to be creative and innovative in your thinking. You have to know how to articulate it. But I think really leadership comes to character. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't have said it any better. 
And you've been in this industry for quite some time. You've been around a lot of agents and brokerages and leaders. What do you see when it comes to leaderships or when it comes to agents? Where do you see they them making mistakes when it comes to leadership? Like whether it's on their own teams or inside the brokerages? Gosh, that's a loaded question. I think the mistake that a lot of leaders make, and I don't even think it's specific to our industry. I think it's specific to leadership is that sometimes as leaders, we forget what the daily struggle is like for people who are following us. Mm -hmm. And we get so wrapped up in our head and our vision of what we want to do. I think we can leave in the dust the people who are going, wait, I followed you because I thought I could learn something from you and you've ditched me. And so I think it's hard for us sometimes to slow down enough to make sure that we're bringing our followers right? The people that we're leading, that we're bringing them up and bringing them along. Some of that is strategy, right? Like you can get the right people in for like the leader can't do everything. So you have to be able to know how to attract and recruit really solid talent that has the same heart. You don't have to do things the same. And in fact, I would challenge most leaders to say, stop hiring people who are just like you because it's not serving you. First of all, you're only hitting one sector of the population. But second of all, if you have everybody like you, you're all running and you're all leaving everybody behind. And so I think more, it's a heart condition, like how you care, how deeply you care um, for the mission, whatever that is, and then your ability to execute it and not worry that it might not be exactly the way the leader would have executed it. You can be different. You can achieve a lot of things together differently. And so I think sometimes leadership, and I think it really is leadership in general, we fall into this place of, well, it was my vision. It's my dream. So it needs to be executed my way. And I think that's where the founders of organizations get in trouble because it's like, well, if you hired the right people, you probably hired people who are more innovative than you, who you had the concept, let them run and build it. And so I think sometimes we have a hard time letting go of our baby, so to speak. And then what happens is we end up not having a good strengthening bond between leading and bringing people with you and as followers. Oh, so perfectly said. It's true. They say hire talent and then get out of the way. But too often as leaders or as founders, we want to micromanage or not let go of the baby, right? right? When it comes to true growth, you've got to let it go and let other people and empower other people to kind of let it go. And you have to be willing to take the bumps with that. Like when you envision it as the leader and the innovator or the person who came, you're the passionate one, right? And so when you have this vision and this perspective of how things should go and you do hire talent and they are good talent, but they don't do it the way you would do it, or the results weren't exactly what you expected them to be. You have to know that you got to take a few on the chin because that's part of your contribution as a leader to bring those people up as leaders, right? And it stretches you as the leader to let go of some of this. And I have to look at what's the main mission. If we can keep like what the main mission is, then I think we end up in a better place to actually execute and build that community while we grow. And I think when people feel like they're part of something, they have a lot more investment into it. They care more about the results of it and the outcome of it versus being just strung along. So I think there's there it's, I think it's hard to let go, but you really have to, and you have to know that that's the healthiest kind of growth you're going to get is letting go and letting people fail and then helping them. Because if you don't let them fail, I think that's a failure of the leader. And I think that's where you can cycle into some really bad places. Yeah, you bring up something that I absolutely love talking about, which is like community, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this day and age, how important is community and how would somebody even create community today? I think community is probably really different by definition and in actuality, pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. I think we have all just looked at, you know, our culture or community and these people we hang with, they're just there. We take them for granted And it's always going to happen like this. And I can just vibe anywhere I go. And I think living in the post-pandemic place, I think people were like, wait a minute, people are actually not disposable. I really care (laughs) about being in connection with people. And I think when you look at it like that and you say, okay, now we have an understanding that it matters and it actually means something, we can 
collectively be better about building community. It's not just a leader dragging along a bunch of people, right? It's, hey, listen, what can we build together? What can we grow? And if people come from a place of contribution, I think you're going to end up getting back more. But if you come into it from this, what's in it for me and how can I gain? I think you limit what's being put in the pot, so to speak, for communities. I think my philosophy around community is it's kind of partnershipy. I mean, I feel, you know, <laughs> it's a really I love that word. word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's partnershipy. But I think when you have people and you acknowledge their contribution to whatever you're trying to build and you encourage them in that and they encourage you and you make contribution and they make contribution and pretty soon you do have this magnetic effect. Where people are like, gosh, something good's happening here. I want to be part of that. These are really good people. I like the integrity. I like the character. I like the fun. I like the innovation. Whatever it is, um, I think it's really cool when you start to just, when you look at it more as I'm leading a group, but sometimes leading from behind or in the middle or on the side is just as effective at, and probably more <laughs> effective sometimes than just trying to yell at people, go, come on, do my thing, do my thing. You know, it doesn't work out that way. <laughs> so I think community is really part of that. Right. You know, and you bring up like pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and now more so than ever, I'm in agreement with you with when it comes to community, whether it's a community that you want to belong to because it's a tribe. Now you've got even social media communities and Facebook groups, and then you've got your own local community and business community of, or what people used to say is like farming, right? That's a whole nother community that is completely different than probably 10 years ago of how we did business. Absolutely. Well, I don't think that people like our consumer base is any different than our industry base, right? If we get down to the basic pieces of it, we're humans. We have a human need to be known and to be loved and to be cared for, right? Nobody wants to live their life unknown, unloved, and uncared for. And so that's just a basic human need. And when you recognize that, I don't care where you are in the hierarchy or the food chain, I think it's more, wow, we're all people, who have needs. Some of us have talents in this area. Some of us have talents in that area. And so I think when we start to really appreciate people for who they are, um, I think it gives our community a, a much stronger um, foundation, right? Because now it's not com competition. It's not, you're threatening me. I feel insecure and squirrely. So mm, I don't think I can hang out with this crowd. I'm going to back myself. You don't have to do that. When you're building community from the edges, right? So you're building and pulling all of these people in and acknowledging their gifts and their talents and their contributions. It gives people a sense of belonging and people want that. Yeah. How did you develop that? I know that you've ran some of the largest organizations. You've ran probably one of the biggest volume brokerages in our state. And now you're a leader of so many different things. How did you develop that? Because I don't see that very often where you got to love people, you got to let people be who they are and accept them for who they are, right? Like a lot of people are forming teams and it's be like me, just exactly what you said. Yeah. I want to find people just like me and everyone's not motivated. We're going to kill it. Yeah. We're going to slay it. We're going to, you know, you're just like, oh, no, you're not. You're going to get slayed. You're going to get killed because you're going to eat each other. That's just how it goes, right? You can't have a bunch of male lions running the pride. There's a male lion. There's a leader, right? And I'm, I think it's interesting when I think about that, how I came about it, honestly, was I was raised by amazing parents and my mom and dad, my dad in particular was very much, if you can understand people, it won't matter what you do in your life. You will find, you will be successful. You'll find a way. And so that resulted in the first time I took the DISC assessment, right? The DISC profile, I was in the fifth grade. So <laughs> super nerd, just made a massive confession. You are a nerd. <laughs> so nerdy, so nerdy. But it really taught me, I mean, I've learned obviously a whole lot since the- Very brilliant, job. by the way. <laughs> I think but nerdy's okay because you're girl. very brilliant. I don't know. <laughs> but I, it, really what it taught me was, number one, who I am. Mm -hmm. And that I am not meant to be who someone else is. And I think that was probably, that was, that's um, what might actually still be an ongoing lesson, right? You see people that you're like, wow, I really admire them. How do I emulate that? Mm -hmm. And at some point you can, but to some degree you cannot because you are not, you don't have that DNA. That's not who you are. 
you can't force that. And when you do, it's so disingenuous. People are like, look, now I feel smarmy and I'm not down for that. So I think really it was, it's more about, okay, lose your sense of judgment. Stop just like assessing people. Cause I think, I just think that's a natural part of life, right? Survival of the fittest. I have to run faster than you. And if I can do that, then that must mean I'm better than you. And really it means that you just run faster. It doesn't mean you're better. It just means you run faster. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You might be a hot mess running super fast, right? So I think when you get comfortable with who you are and know who you are, and then get really clear about what stamp you want to make in life. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a really brief example. One of my coaching clients, um, I go through a bunch of stuff at the beginning of a relationship. It's a lot of assessments. It's a lot of talking a lot of time that we just answering questions back and forth to make sure we're the right fit. And I'm probably like, I don't know, 80% through with that. And I get to the part where I talk about contribution. What in your life, like, where do you want to contribute? How do you want to make people's lives better? Like, where do you see you contributing? (laughs) And he just looked at me, goes, why would I do that? And I was like, what? I, I mean, I had to like really school my face. And I was like, well, why wouldn't you do that? And he's, I'm not living my life to make other people happy. They're not living their life to make my, I'm like, it was so, and I just sat there and <laughs> then I got mad and I was like, yeah, we, we're not coaching together. Right. Because we're so far out of a line. I can't, I can't do that. That's not in my nature. And so I'm not going to coach somebody against my nature or against their nature. And so when I look at building community and leadership and why that's, I think so so important. It's because we just need to validate people. Everybody's looking for some sort. I'm not exempt, right? If I do something great, I want someone somewhere to go. Nice job. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. And if nobody does, I go, well, nobody gets it. Then I get all indignant and mad. So it's, that doesn't serve. (laughs) So then you have to go, okay, I did it because I wanted to make a contribution, not because I needed Raquel to give me a high five. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a bonus. But the fact that I did something from my conviction that was giving and making the world a better place, making something easier for someone, overcoming something, a challenge for somebody, helping them walk through that. I think that's, to me, that's how you earn the right to be in community and expect people to stay because you can, it's reciprocated, right? When they need something, you're there. When you need something, they're there. And it doesn't, I don't think that it's mutually exclusive from a leader to a follower. And I think my dad was really wise in teaching us really young about understanding people and our humanness and being able to say, you don't have to judge them for the decisions or choices they make. They might not be your choices and decisions, granted, but mine probably aren't theirs either. Mm -hmm. And that is not necessarily something you overcome. I think there are temptations when people do really dumb things. You're just like, what the heck? It's hard not to go. I would never have done it that way. Why would they? And you know, and you go, okay, back it up. You don't, you weren't there. You don't know. So it's, I think it's a constant thing. And I think for a leader, particularly, I think you have to be really careful of that because it's easy when you have a lot of experience with humanity to just start categorizing people and going, okay, you're the type that, man, if somebody says you're the type that to me, I'm just like, I want to just put them in the box, right? I do. I do. That's a throat punch. (laughs) You know, you just dropped so much gold right there with just seeing people being part of community and how do you keep, and you lead a community because I see your posts, I see your legend stuff. Like how do you keep a community engaged? Uh, that part's a lot of work because I think you have Thank to- you for admitting that because a lot of people don't. <laughs> it's a it's a lot of work. And I think really what happens is you have to be intentional about it. And you have to constantly be, be thinking, what can I do that's going to bring them value? What can I do that's helpful? How, and, and I hate that word when everybody says, what do I do? Oh, just bring value. Okay. What's valuable? <laughs> like, I don't know. It means something different to everybody else, right? And I know a bunch of junk that nobody cares about. So I'm like, yeah. well, I don't know what's valuable. I think you have to be astute to know the people that you're leading so that you can hear and know what their needs are. And I don't think you can bury your head in the sand and just go, well, I think it should be this. And so we're going to make it this. And pretty soon you become very unrelatable. And so I think for me, it it is so much work 
to be in touch with people and every opportunity I have trying to connect with people and go, Hey, what's going on in your life? What's happening in your business? It's no different actually than what we do as agents with our past clients and our sphere of influence and our network of people to just have a human care, but it takes effort. And somebody texted me the other day and I was like, Oh, dang it. You've been on my list to text. I hate when they beat me to it. It makes me so cranky at myself. Cause like for three days, I'm like, I got to reach out. I got to reach out. And I just didn't. And so I don't like that part, but I think it is a lot of work it's, but it's intentional and it's not hard work. It's yeah. not, these are not challenging, really difficult things. I mean, people tell me things that I'm like, Ooh, you're really, that's tough. That's ooh, ah, let's go. <laughs> right. And I think you have to be worthy of being told things so that people will share. So you have to be a vault of information. And the minute that I start telling anybody, anybody's secrets is the last conversation I'll ever have, you know, yeah. because you have to have that trust. And so to build the community, it is really looking out for being in touch with them. What do you need? What do you, what, where's your pain point? How can I help? And if I can't help, I'm going to call someone. I'm going to find someone to connect you to and see if we can't, you know, and if nothing else, I'm just going to sit by you and just go we'll cry together, I guess. Cause I don't know what to do either. <laughs> Well, you're definitely a vault of information. And like I said, you lead different agents and you see them and you coach them, you teach them. What would you say would be three things if you had to start all over today? What would be three things that every agent should do if they wanted to be successful? Oh, I, I can name two of them right off the bat. The number one thing is well, maybe that will lead to the third one. So number one is you don't know anything. So stop pretending. <laughs> this is not a fake it or make it business. You've got to know it. So stop acting like you know stuff and go learn. And if that means, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's true. Oh my gosh, the arrogance of somebody who got their ink dry on their license yesterday is unbelievable to me sometimes. And I'm just like, wow, okay. This is going to be super fun. How about you do this? So I think check your ego at the door. You don't know anything. Be really teachable. Uh, I think the second thing probably is when you're starting, you need to find a community of people who are successful. Can, can I be really blunt? Stop yes. hanging around the office with all the people who hang around in the office. These aren't people that are knocking it down at $10 million a year, right? Come on. It's just not happening. So stop doing that go to your training, stop whining about it. Don't worry about splits. You don't have any right to earn any money because you don't know anything. So stop thinking that you should have this amazing split and this, it's just dumb. And I think combined in all of that is it's probably wise to look for a really good team. That's a really good fit for you. And not every team is equal. And a lot of teams have different niches. And so they have different ways to think about how to do the business. So you have to find someone that you're in alignment with. And then honestly, from just a basic education place, you, I think every agent should have to get their license. And before they do anything, they should need to complete their GRI. Mm. And that is a designation in the, in our industry. And because it touches on so many of the basics of things you need to know about running a business, like a simple little thing called the p &L and mm. knowing what your expenses are. A lot of people that get into our industry are not business people. They were people who had jobs that said, oh my gosh, I have a great personality. I love HGTV. Model homes are my jam. I'm going to be a real estate. And you're like, you have no business sense. You, know? <laughs> like, you have no idea that you're your own marketing department and that you're you know, the janitor and the CEO and you do everything in between. And so I think GRI is a really good like a grounder <laughs> for, oh, I didn't know I needed to think about it like that. And so I think those are just some, I don't know. Yeah. And for those that are listening, I'm trying not to like laugh. I'm cracking up because I don't want to mess the recording, but that's graduate is, I think it's called graduate, graduate real, real estate, real estate. graduate real estate institute. institute institute. That's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah. Thank you. And then after that, it's like your CRS. Cause I remember that back. Yeah. Then. then there's a whole bunch of alphabet you can get afterwards, but that's it. I think the thing about that particular set of coursework is it's yeah. basically the fun. Of, I didn't get my GRI until I was three years into it. And I was like, geez, I would have liked to have had this. Um, yeah. I didn't know how to think about the real estate industry specifically. And that did a very good job of that. So that's my plug for them. I don't get paid for it or anything, but I do think agents should know about how to run a business and not just, just because I can fill out a contract that makes me a professional 
It really doesn't. I think a lot of times we are the self-employed unemployed because we don't know how to run a business. And yeah. if we don't learn that, then you can be doing the same thing for 30 years and never figure it out. And that's a disservice to you, your family, and then the client base that you help, I think. Mm-hmm. Where do you see agents winning today or even teams winning today? Uh, honestly, I think it's the more people contact they have. I think if you used to be able to spend an hour a day on the phone talking to people, now maybe you're having to spend four hours a day to yield the same kind of business level. But I think it's I think the people who are digging deep into the relationships that they've built and the acquaintances that they have to build those, I think that's where people are winning. I think it's put your head down and do the work. It's not, it's actually not very difficult. It's just do the work. Yeah. It's call the people, build your database. And at the end of the day, it's a contact sport. It's a relationship business. And so people that have the relationships are going to win regardless of what's happening in your state. Right. Well, then, well, and the market conditions are irrelevant if you have the relationships. And so that database, you know, when you, you think about how powerful that database is and how many agents don't have one (laughs) mind boggling to me or don't Uh, touch it or don't touch it. Don't do anything with it. This is, first of all, you can set those things up to be automated. So at least they, if, if, even if you write terribly and you don't know how to use any kind of punctuation properly, I don't care. At least they saw your name, (laughs) let it go, man. And you're not going to just get this by, I don't know. I just, I think you have this great, easy tool. It's not super expensive to run a CRM. You should be disciplined about that. And then you should do what the CRM tells you to do. It's basically your manager telling you, Hey, Raquel, you need to call these seven people today. Or Fred Jones likes this house so much. He's looked at it 28 times in the last 31 hours. Okay. Maybe I should call Fred and see if I can't shake a deal out of him because we have a relationship. It's not awkward. Right. And so I think the more that people really value and spend their time, effort, energy in their database, I think that they become more insulated from any kind of market economics. Yeah, so true. Speaking of managing your database, how do you manage your business, your life? How do you balance it all? <laughs> I drink a lot of water. <laughs> water um, Yep. Yeah. I'm surprised I'm, you didn't say anything else. Well, I drink some of that too. <laughs> I must say it's three W's. It's water, whiskey, and wine, I think is what how it shakes out, but <laughs> not very much of the other two and a whole lot of the first one. Um, yeah, I think it's about for me, if it's not in my calendar, it doesn't exist. Even to the point of it's the holidays and I have an advent little sleigh, and I need to buy the four starburst per every day that fit in the little drawer because we have four littles that come to pick those out every day. And I'm like, if I don't put it in my calendar, go buy Starburst. I have a five minute slot for buying Star. I'll make everything's in my calendar. And so if I don't, if it's not in there, I don't do it. And if it is in there, I do it. If I can't do it because something happened, then I don't just blow past the notification. I move it so that it goes. And so for me, it's, I mean, I have a pretty pretty regulated schedule, which is weird because I have my calendar link out there for the whole world. Right? So you're like, how much is really regulated? But I have designated times that I allow people in because I know I have to manage the rest of it. If I don't manage that, I'm sunk. There's, I just, yeah. I don't even know how to do it if yeah. I didn't buy my calendar. So true. You do a lot of things. What's one lesson you wish you would have known sooner? Oh, in life or in real estate, parents. Let's talk real estate and then we'll talk life. Yeah. Um, I think, honestly, in real estate, if I would have really understood at the beginning the value of a team, I think I could have catapulted my success so much faster. I moved to Arizona from California and I literally knew my husband and our kids, right? I knew no one. And then I went to real estate school. So then the only other people I knew were other realtors and then all the lenders and the title people wanted to be my friend. So I had this great real estate network. I didn't know a soul out in the real world. And so I was like, who? they're like, you should call, you should have 50 calls a day or a hundred calls a day. I'm like, who, who do I call? I'll call them. I don't know who. And I, and no one could ever tell me. They're like, buy a list, a list of what? I just didn't know what I didn't know. I came from a business background. So I knew how to build a business, but I was like, 
hello. And yeah, it was crazy. So I think for me personally, if I would have understood how much I could have benefited from a good team, I had some teams around me that I wasn't really impressed with their leader. So their leader, I begged off because of that. And I was like, yeah, you're actually not the kind of person I want to hang with. And I, yeah, no. So I did not pursue looking for other teams or any of that. I was like, nope, I'll just begin on my own. And another guy got licensed about the same time I did. And he came from, he was a corporate negotiator for a big fortune, I think 100 company. And anyway, we both got into real estate at the same time. So we had a lot in common. <laughs> so we basically brokered each other's deals. Hey, if I'm going to write a contract, would you say this? Would you say it this way? And we just babysat each other through our first year. And I do, <laughs> it was great. And I don't regret it because I worked like a dog, but I also think I could have learned a lot things, a lot more things, a lot faster and not had as many pain points or at least hit them faster and moved on. So true. So true. You've got so many things that you have coming up. What are you most excited about, Kimberly? Oh, uh, well, that you're working on. Say so again. Share that you're working on that you can share, you share. with our audience. Or- um, I can share a few things actually. I created something a little over a year ago, a year ago, October or September, I guess. I created something called Lions and Legends, <clears throat> and it was really to build community because. Uh, I was working to build our company here, but it's beyond that. It's not just company, it's anybody. And I just felt like, gosh, we need community so badly. And particularly in our industry, our industry is difficult. This is not an easy business. And the I had a conversation today. I said, it's really the highest compliment you can get is when your clients go to get their license because you made it look so easy. <laughs> like, and they have this sad day of reckoning when they're like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. I can't do this. Right. But So it's, I think it's a hard business. And so I created Lions and Legends and I was like, I know that I like, it's a weekly Zoom that we have together. They get an email every Thursday. So we try to connect, stay connected that way. But I just felt, gosh, that this is not big enough. This is not, this is not, we're not doing it. This is good. And I like this and it's a foundational piece, but I think there needs to be more. And I think if I look at my, my little sticky, my yellow brain, I had this like moment of like revelation and I was like, oh my gosh, I need to take the legends to the lions. And so I created a strategic business conference for South Africa. And so I know it's unbelievable. So it's called in the council of lions. And we, the initial plan is that we were going to be there this coming February And there's some political things happening in the world right now that make that not necessarily super safe and unpredictable. And of all the people that were connected to, you know, having filled out their applications and paid their money and ready to go, I surveyed them. And then I surveyed another subset of people and just said, hey, would you feel better (laughs) if it was fall of 24 or spring of 25 if we decide to push this off? And unanimously hands down, every single one of them said, how about spring of 25? That gives us a little more time to think about what this could look like geopolitically in the world. So I'm like, okay, no problem. So my heart is a little sad because I've been looking forward to this February, but I will look forward to the next February also. But it is, it's super cool. It is basically, we are going as entrepreneurs. So it's not even just real estate people. I have people from other industries coming Um, and we will go and we will work with local entrepreneurs in South Africa, some from various villages that are like, there's one group that's seven women and they, they want to start a sewing business. We will go and we will have our own masterminds in the mornings. And then we will spend time in the afternoons with various uh, business leaders and up and coming entrepreneurs so that we can pour into them. And then you can't go to Africa and not I mean, you go to Africa and people go, oh my gosh, you're going to safari? No, <laughs> yeah, of course. So I have three different safaris planned for three different things. We'll, and then there's a whole nother elephant experience. So we'll do a lot of stuff where you get the African experience. We will not be staying in mud huts with straw roofs. That's not my jam. <laughs> so everything that we're staying in is pretty, pretty awesome. So it's a pretty luxury based trip. So it's 10 days. Super good. Maximum number of people for each one is 25. 
So I've slotted that we can do three sets of those 10 days with a few days in between so I can recoup a little bit and get the, the next round of speakers. So yeah, so that's pretty fun. So that's coming that up again. So exciting. Where can people connect with you if they are interested? Yeah, I mean, just reach out to me. Easy, you can find me on Instagram at Kimberly Ryan dot join real. You can find me on Facebook at Kimberly Ryan. You can call me at 623-687-6324. There it is. So you can text you your call. <laughs> and we'll put it all in the show notes so that you guys all can connect with her very easily. And as we wrap up, there's always one question that I love asking every guest that comes on the show is what does Kimberly do to play bigger in business or in life? Oh yeah. So the playing bigger thing is I, so I told you I live and die by my calendar. So I, <laughs> uh, I schedule time for thinking. So I told you earlier, I'm such a nerd, but uh, I spend time thinking and trying to find little places where I'm going to be excited about something, things where I'm like, okay, if I get my passion in line about this, is that something I could blow up and do and play? And who would I want to bring along? So it's intentional thinking because for me, it, it's, I don't think it's fun ever to do anything by myself. I'd rather do, I want, I want a pack of people. Yeah. Like I think it's fun to play with everybody. And I think you just get a better product out of that. And so for me, it is, I am very dedicated to my thinking time and thinking time looks like all technology is off, no music. I'm not reading a book. I'm literally just with myself right? and going, okay, what are we thinking about today? And sometimes it's intentional thinking. If I have something I want to think about, yeah. then I'm like, okay, let's talk through it. I get out my whiteboard and just brainstorm. So to me, my tool for playing bigger and my tool for building and creating is really just founded in thinking time. Such a good nugget. It's interesting that you say that because so many of the people that I met in my first billionaire that I ever worked for in the startup world had that on his calendar, thinking time. Oh, nice. And, yeah, cool. and then you see that as people start to sell their business or exit their business, they actually have strategic thinking time in their calendar. So I love that you said, said that. Yeah, I think you have to, I think, you know, in a weird way, I think we already have all the information in our heads we need. We just, we have such an influx of info coming in, but we don't have enough time to process or put it out the right way. And so I think sometimes it's just sifting through things to be able to go, oh, I took that little nugget from that book, that thing from that podcast, that from that conversation, then my own creativity, and then I throw it back. It's part of the process. So I think having time to process things is super important. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for being on our show today. I appreciate you. I value your time. I know your time is super valuable and I can't wait to keep supporting you in playing bigger. Yay. Thanks for having me. 